Due to the large number of subscribers who have joined in the last year, as well as renewed interest in the subject, I've decided to post in its entirety all four parts of my reparation series here as one complete video. This is not going to be a comprehensive list that would take the rest of my life. But we are going to make sure that we mention just a few of the big players in American society who happen to have benefited off of the slave trade and who still benefit from it to the present day. The first thing that must always be remembered is that the United States is a debtor nation. But the white media and the white government are always lying about who this country owes a debt to. We built this country. Those of us who are descended from America's slaves. Those of us who can trace our ancestry back to the killing fields of the American South. And this den of vipers that has wronged us every moment of every day for 500 years owes us everything. We are this nation's creditors. This country is our debtor. They owe us. This country owes us everything. And we are calling in all those debts. But ever since 1865, there has been a massive creditor-debtor standoff in this country. The deadbeats who owe us have used every means at their sick, demented disposal in their perverted effort to avoid paying what they owe. Well, black empowerment is on the march, and we are here to collect. The question is not who owes. Everyone in this country whose ancestry does not go back to the plantations of the American South owes us, and that includes the Red Indians, not to be confused with the black ones. It doesn't matter if you're an immigrant, even a black immigrant. You came here because you wanted a piece of the world's greatest economy that our ancestors built. You wanted something you didn't create. You knew there was a corrupt cabal of thieves and murderers who would give you a few crumbs if you allied yourselves with them against us. The U.S. is not a country. It is the world's biggest crime scene, the scene of the greatest and worst crime in human history. And not only have the perpetrators of that crime not been brought to justice, the crime is still ongoing to this very moment. There's no question that we're owed, and no question about who owes us. The only question is, who do we start with? Who do we wring our money out of first? That's what this three-part weekly series is about. It's about giving us just a few of those names. All you have to do is look at the oldest companies in this country, some of the oldest families and even oldest schools in this country, and you'll see a who's who of slave owners and beneficiaries of slavery. Most of them were directly slave owners, and for those who claim not to have personally owned slaves, they usually did business with and benefited directly from those who did. Since we deal with power, wealth, and influence here, you know this series has to start with corporate America. As Jason Black has always said, the strength of white supremacy lies in its economy. Emphasis on the lie part. That's what slavery was all about. That's why they felt they could afford to abandon chattel slavery so long as they locked us out of the economy, which has been what they've done for 150 plus years. So, who do we start with first? The institution whose very name is synonymous with America's economic might. Wall Street. The meter on their debt began running in 1626, when black people were brought as slaves to what today is Manhattan. Slavery became the foundation of New York's wealth and the engine of the American economy. Most people are taught that New York wasn't a slave state because it wasn't in the South. That's a lie. New York had slavery, and during the Civil War, New York was allied with the South, just like Delaware, which Joe Biden loves to brag about until he ran for president. To give you an idea of how widespread the slavery was in New York City, consider this. By 1730, one out of every five New Yorkers was a slave. And two out of every five New Yorkers owned slaves. Now this was over 45 years before the Declaration of Independence was even written, and New York City was already leading the league in slave owners. That means New York City had the second highest number of slave owners per capita in America. That percentage is higher than Atlanta, Baltimore, Birmingham, or even New Orleans. Only Charleston, South Carolina had a higher percentage. The Dutch had set up their little outpost on the southern tip of what today is called Manhattan. And that's where the wall that Wall Street is named after was built, but not by the Dutch. 
It was built by our ancestors. We literally built Wall Street. We were the ones who cleared the land that today bears names like Broadway. Now, the reason for the wall was to be a fortification against Indian raids, but in truth, it was a defense against the British, who the Dutch were at war with. The Dutch called this little outpost New Amsterdam. However, the Dutch only had a few outposts in the Americas, so the British had them vastly outnumbered and geographically surrounded. The Dutch eventually surrendered their little outpost of New Amsterdam to the British, who renamed it New York. By 1699, the invaders, I mean settlers, felt they had enough numbers now to take land outside of that little fortress. So they deconstructed the wall. Slavery, however, wasn't going anywhere. Under the British, slavery was about to become the biggest, most lucrative industry in New York, and Wall Street would be its epicenter. In 1711, a slave market was built on Wall Street along the eastern shore, remaining there until 1762. I want you to think about that. Before Wall Street played host to a number of multinational banking conglomerates and all these captains of industry held before there was even a United States of America, Wall Street was a slave market 65 years before the Declaration of Independence was even written. And the Wall Street slave market was an important generator of taxes for New York City. Now, whenever most people think about Wall Street, the image that almost instantly comes to mind is the New York Stock Exchange building, so we'll start there. The NYSE was founded in 1792. The first shares traded at the NYSE were for the First Bank of the United States. The founder and first president of the First Bank of the United States was a man called Thomas Willing. Thomas Willing was a slave owner, naturally, and he had founded a shipping company with a business partner, Robert Morris. They called their shipping firm Willing, Morris & Company. Their company was involved in the slave trade, which helped make Willing a rich man. He took the proceeds of his dirty business and used it to invest in the fledgling New York Stock Exchange. Also among the very first shares traded at the New York Stock Exchange were for the Bank of North America. Thomas Willing's business partner, Robert Morris, he was the man primarily responsible for financing the start of the Bank of North America. Morris had put a ton of his own money into it, and this helped him to attract outside investors. Robert Morris came from a wealthy family of slave owners, and like his pal Thomas Willing, Morris himself owned at least two black people as slaves. This made Robert Morris one of the richest men in pre-revolutionary America, with money made in large part from the slave trade. And these were two of the very first shares traded on Wall Street. This was what provided the seed money for the New York Stock Exchange. But as we all know, the word banking means a lot more than just a place to put your money. It also deals with financial instruments, too. And this is where insurance companies come in. As the New York Times Magazine reported, New Yorkers invested heavily in the growth of Southern plantations, catching the wave of the first cotton boom. Southern planters who wanted to buy more land and black people borrowed funds from New York bankers and protected the value of bought bodies with policies from New York insurance companies. They're talking about insurance companies like New York Life. Originally, the company was named Nautilus Mutual Life Insurance in 1841. In 1849, they changed their name to New York Life, but it's the exact same company. And these weren't small timers either. As New York Life's own website puts it, their original board of trustees were some of the most influential merchants and captains of industry in the city of New York. Indeed, as the New York Times put it, some of the city's wealthiest merchants, bankers, and railroad magnates. And what was New York Life doing? How did they make their seed money? They began looking south to see if any slave owners would like to insure their human property. In February 1846, one New York Life agent sold over 30 policies in a single day. New York Life clearly wanted to expand their involvement in this dirty business because they immediately began taking out ads in southern newspapers from North Carolina to Kentucky asking if plantation owners wanted to get their slaves insured. Insuring slaves wasn't a new idea, nor was it limited only to North America. 
The British insurance company Lloyd's of London made their fortune insuring the slave ships and their captives for the better part of 200 years. Taking out insurance policies on them once they were imprisoned on the plantations, however, was something of a novel concept, but one that New York life made a killing on. Slave policies would come to make up a third of New York life's business. The president of New York life, James DePire Ogden, would give a tisk-tisk ascribing the word evil to slavery, but clearly it wasn't evil enough for him to turn any of that money down. Whenever some white supremacist tries to tell you that these slave owners and their business pals felt regret about taking part in slavery, you just remember that none of these guys ever did anything about it. There's been a cottage industry in revisionist and outright liars trying to rewrite the history books, to downplay or even deny the part that all these white captains of industry played in slavery. Amazing how all the rich and powerful white politicians and bankers and financiers and other influential white men all allegedly decried slavery, and yet these rich and powerful white men just couldn't put their heads together and do anything about it. They could, however, help slavery to spread. They could help to reinforce it through legislation. That they could do. So don't ever let anyone take some meaningless slave owner's quote out of context, then add their layer of spin to it and tell you, well, this slave owner, he wasn't as bad as all that. If you truly regret something, then you have to make amends for it. An insincere apology 200 years after the fact is tantamount to a slap in the face. New York Life is a Fortune 100 company, and they built their fortune off the slave trade. If they were sorry, they'd be paying reparations. And New York Life was hardly alone. AIG also has dirty hands. One of AIG's subsidiaries, U.S. Life, sold policies to slave owners. As did Aetna. But of course, the banks were the ones who made the most off of slavery. Citibank, Bank of America, Wells Fargo, and of course, J.P. Morgan Chase, they all bought banks whose wealth and assets were made by slavery. Profiteering off of slavery was so lucrative and so attractive that even companies that hadn't started off as banks eagerly wanted to become banks so that they could get a piece of the action too. The now defunct Lehman Brothers is a prime example of that. Lehman Brothers was started by three Jewish siblings. Henry and Emmanuel, who were later joined by their younger sibling, Meyer. Lehman Brothers was started in Alabama as a dry goods store, not a bank. With cotton being king in those days, and considering the South was as backwards then as it is now, the Lehman Brothers wound up having to accept cotton as payment for their merchandise. And just to show you that dealing in slave-grown cotton wasn't some incidental factor for the Lehman Brothers, that it was in fact something that they themselves approved of, we know that at least one of the Lehman Brothers, Meyer Lehman, was recorded in the 1860 census as being the owner of seven slaves, one as young as five years old. That's an important fact to point out. Lehman Brothers didn't just bump elbows with slave owners, they were slave owners. These guys didn't have some passing tangential connection to the slave trade, they were neck deep in it. One of Wall Street's longest standing and most prestigious financial firms was started by a bunch of slave owners. After a while, they thought they spotted an opportunity. They decided to get into the cotton trading business because apparently that's how much cotton they wound up having on hand. Their foray into the commodities market took off and made them rich. They opened a branch office in New York, and they would later completely move their entire operation there, setting up the New York Cotton Exchange in 1870. The Lehman Brothers parlayed their money from trading slave cotton into underwriting upstart companies like Sears Roebuck. They would later go into underwriting bonds for the railroads. But that's another story. One of the most lucrative financial practices by the banks were slave mortgages. You heard me right. Using our ancestors as collateral for banknotes was a very popular practice, and not just among some ham and egger slave owner with one or two slaves. Thomas Jefferson mortgaged 150 of his slaves so that he could raise the money to build Monticello. Slave owners would frequently take out multiple mortgages on the same slave, thereby increasing how much money they could get their hands on. And if the loan couldn't be paid, well, let the financiers fight amongst themselves to see who takes possession of the slave then. 
As the Los Angeles Times reported it, how the founders got into debt was simple. Each year, they sold their tobacco to European merchants, mainly British, primarily in exchange for the goods that supported their lavish lifestyles. As tobacco prices fell, but their desire for material comforts remained, they paid for that lifestyle on credit, extended by many of the same merchants. The patricians of July 4th bristled at their independence being clipped by British creditors, and that independence being so deeply predicated on tobacco, their main way of raising the money owed to those creditors. Tobacco was demanding to grow, and without slaves to raise their crops, Jefferson, Washington, and other slave owners would have been far too busy farming to have had the leisure to contemplate the lofty ideals of liberty. In this way, liberty was tied directly to slavery. Although it would be incorrect to say that the founders went to war with Britain just to get out from under debt, their mounting debt predisposed them to be open to the idea of separating from Britain, resulting in the Declaration of Independence and the Revolutionary War. In the years following America's victory in that war, deep debt continued to hang over Jefferson. He sought repayment plans with his European creditors and used his slaves, whom he listed by name, as collateral against that repayment. In this regard, Jefferson was at the leading edge of a blossoming trend. Although tobacco eventually yielded to cotton, an entire financial services industry emerged from slave-backed loans before the Civil War through what one economic historian called an orgy of bank creation. The international, read European, finance markets also benefited tremendously from slave mortgages. The slave owners would take out a slave mortgage on a number of their slaves, our ancestors, and then package those mortgages together into bonds, which they would then market all over the world, because slave bonds were understood to be one of the safest investments there were. Europeans, the British, they all wanted a piece of the action. The Louisiana Purchase, often hailed as the greatest land transaction of all time, gave the fledgling United States double the amount of land for our ancestors to be forced to work on because more land meant more cotton, which meant more money for the white slavers, but not for us. Now, something that doesn't get taught in American schools, though, is the United States government at that time didn't have the money to actually pay Napoleon for the Louisiana Territory. That financing was handled by a bank called Baring Brothers, a British commercial bank. As American Heritage Magazine put it, technically, we didn't buy the Louisiana Purchase from Napoleon. We bought it from Baring Brothers. Bering Brothers had already made a fortune off the slave trade in the Caribbean before they turned their eyes northward. After the Louisiana Purchase, Bering Brothers vastly increased and spread their financial dealings in the U.S. Bering Brothers would make deals with slavery organizations like the Consolidated Association of the Planters of Louisiana. Bering would bundle slave mortgages, like the kind CAPL carried, into bonds, which Bering would then sell to European investors. So next time someone tells you that Britain or this or that other European power had abolished slavery or that they didn't really practice slavery themselves, you'll know to remind them that although the British island didn't have slave plantations, the British gladly did business with everyone who did. Slavery was a global organization. It was the very genesis of globalization. Everyone wanted in because all of them were getting filthy, stinking rich off of enslaving us. You didn't have to own slaves personally or even be located in the U.S. to get rich off of American slavery. The capital from these British and European banks provided the American slave owners with access to a huge pool of credit at low interest rates. They used this money to expand their evil operation, to buy more land and bring as many black people into suffering as possible. Slave mortgages were an example of a self-perpetuating criminal enterprise. The more you do it, the more lucrative it becomes, which is the more people want to do it. So understand that everybody from the sharecropper good old boy with only one or two slaves all the way up to President Jefferson was involved in slave mortgages. And just in case the slave owner was unable to pay his debts and defaulted, the bank would take possession of the slaves. Though, as we've seen for the last few hundred years, our enslavement has proved to be the most lucrative business transaction in human history.
Slave bonds paid for the railroad industry. As The Economist wrote in 2013, slave capital earned at least equal returns to those from other forms of capital investment, such as railroad bonds. The rate of return on slaves could be as high as 13%, compared to a yield of 6 to 8% on the railroads. And even after the Civil War, the U.S. Supreme Court ruled that plantation owners who owed debts on those slave bonds still had to pay them. So these white supremacists used the enslavement and brutality against our ancestors here as a license to print money. Every big industry in this country either was directly involved in the slave trade or got their funding from companies who were. A lot of white people try to claim they didn't benefit from slavery, and many of them try to claim their families built this country, but that's a lie. Most white people in the United States can only trace their first ancestor here back to the late 19th century, a hundred years after the U.S. government was established, and two to nearly three centuries after the first black people were brought as slaves to build the Americas. These white immigrants came to a land that was already built. And as we see with Wall Street and the U.S. Capitol, it was black people who built the wall and the streets. It wasn't the Irish, they weren't here yet. It wasn't the Asians, they wouldn't arrive for another nearly 200 years. It wasn't the Italians, they didn't arrive in any appreciable numbers until the 20th century. Donald Trump's family is German, but his folks didn't wash up on America's shores until the late 1880s. And yet Donald Trump, just like America itself, told the lie that New York City was largely a result of men like him and his family who built fortunes there when the reality was they were not there with the slave markets, they were not there with the slave mortgages, or when the banks needed to be financed. They were taking advantage of wealth that other people, black people, made possible. It is the quintessential American fiction that immigrants built the country. The immigrants all came here because black people had already built it. There's a reason why the Irish emigres fleeing the potato famine there didn't flee to Britain, didn't flee to Canada, didn't flee to Germany, didn't flee to France. All of them came here. They came here so they could enjoy the fruits of our ancestors' labors. And we've got the receipts. Now, obviously, there's a lot more to the details of how New York City in general and Wall Street in specific owes us reparations, but I think the point is made. The wealth that these companies stole from us didn't vanish, just like New York companies who became so wealthy off of our enslavement didn't vanish. The money's still there, and hell, a lot of the companies are still there. They changed names or got bought out by bigger banks, but that changes nothing. Why did those bigger banks like Chase want to buy those slave profiteering banks in the first place? Because of how much money they had. If a thief steals someone's wallet and then gives it to you, that doesn't stop it from being stolen property. So the financial sector, Wall Street, is just one filthy example of who owes us reparations. The same banks who destroyed the financial system 13 years ago also destroyed our families as well. These banks and corporations owe us, and they defaulted on that debt a long time ago. Well, as banks, they know exactly how it works when a debtor refuses to pay. The difference being our ancestors didn't deserve what happened to them. And these degenerates do. These days, there's an enormous debate about fixing and updating the United States' decrepit infrastructure. But understand that when we're talking about infrastructure, that means a heck of a lot more than just roads. It's bridges, waterways, railroads, docks and piers, airports, power plants, irrigation, pipes, power lines, communications, and more. But for the sake of this discussion, we're going to limit infrastructure mostly to what we think of as transportation systems. Specifically railroads, because aside from steamships, railroads were a primary means of transportation during chattel slavery and helped to revolutionize the profits of the slavery industry. When it came to railroads and even steam engines, the slave south had the industrial north beat by a country mile. Several hundred miles, to be honest. Walter Johnson, in his book River of Dreams, Slavery and Empire in the Cotton Kingdom, wrote that steam engines were more prevalent on the Mississippi River than in New England. Slave labor for cotton and other commodities made steamships a profitable business. Slave owners would often rent out black people to be labor on the steamboats. But the railroads were even worse. Now you have a form of transportation that was far faster than a steamboat and wasn't bound by the waterways. 
it could go directly to its destination. Southern slave owners were the main stockholders and directors of many railroad companies. The South became a place where railroad building boomed, building some of the earliest and longest rail lines in the U.S. In the beginning, the railroads rented slaves, but before long, the railroads began buying slaves themselves outright. Wachovia gave a feeble apology for one of the banks it had acquired, Georgia Railroad and Banking Company, which owned at least 162 black people as slaves. The railroads were built with black labor and paid for with slave bonds. One estimate places over 10,000 black people being forced to build the railroads every year. It was a self-perpetuating cycle of misery. Build more railroads, move more cotton. The railroads become more valuable, which incentivizes the building of even more railroads, and so on. Since so much of the ties between slavery and the economy were in Louisiana, we're going to use them as a case study. Louisiana State University's website features a thesis paper written by social scientist and historical scholar Merle Elwin Reed in 1957. The great thing about Reed's research is that he uses practically all primary sources. That means that he had to get the original records from the railroad companies themselves and from the state legislature. We'll start with the New Orleans and Nashville Railroad. We already know the railroads began using slave labor practically from the moment they laid down the first lines in the 1830s. Now, the guys who planned the railroads in the South were usually plantation owners or merchants adjacent to the plantations who were trying to figure out more efficient ways to move the slave-derived cargo. But there's no railways or anything else unless somebody pays for it. And who paid for the railroads? The government. Federal, state, and local. In the early 19th century, there was an iron tariff in place by the U.S. Congress to help protect the Pennsylvania steel industry from foreign steel manufacturing competition. But in order to encourage industrialization, in 1832, the U.S. Congress granted a special tariff waiver to iron used for railroad lines. This was a big help to the railroads like the ones in New Orleans because without that waiver, a railroad in New Orleans would have had to pay $197 a ton for steel from Pittsburgh, as opposed to the $50 a ton that they could get it for from the English. That's an almost 75% savings. So right from the jump, the U.S. Congress altered tax policy to benefit one industry in specific. Uh, can you think of any time that Congress did that for black people? I'll wait. This is what Jason Black means when he says a key practice of white supremacy is picking and choosing winners. They want to decide who the winners will be. They don't leave it up to chance. With the Congressional Act, the railroad industry was insulated from having to pay the same price for iron as every other business in the country. But that wasn't all. Normally, whenever someone wants to start a corporation, they have to get stockholders together. Well, the good old boys down in Bayou Land were never savvy businessmen, so naturally they had trouble finding gullible fools with more money than sense. So they went to the New Orleans City Council, who the railroad had conveniently reserved 5,000 shares for, you know, just in case the city wants to get in on the action. I'm sure that's just a coincidence. The New Orleans and Nashville Railroad asked the city council to buy their stock and issue bonds based on it. The New Orleans City Council agreed, ponying up bonds to the tune of half a million dollars. Now keep in mind, that was in the early 1830s, so adjusted for inflation it would be a hell of a lot more today. But even a big infusion of cash like that wasn't enough. These would-be railroad magnates wanted to go to New York or even to Europe to seek investors, but they already knew that neither Wall Street nor the English banks would invest in shady ventures from clearly incompetent businessmen unless, as Merle Elwin Reed put it, some responsible agency other than the chartered railroad company agreed to underwrite the loans. And, since no private company was willing to invest in their railroad, they went to Louisiana's state legislature, who eagerly gave them the money. The Louisiana legislature decided to underwrite these railroads and began issuing bonds based on the credit of the state. So, the legislature put the taxpayer on the hook if these guys failed to pay their investors. Of course, if you're going to build a railway, you'll need someone to survey the area that the railroad route will run through and to determine materials and costs. Fortunately, the state legislature paid for that too. 
As Merle Reed put it, free surveys were a boon to the railroads because qualified engineers were scarce and their services costly. But even that was just the beginning of the help that the railroads got from the state. The legislature authorized loans to be given to the railroads. The state and local governments also granted the rail lines monopolies on routes. But in addition to bonds, loans, and monopolies, the state also gave the railroads long-term tax exemptions, rights of way through state land, and the power of eminent domain over private property. Even the federal government got in on the act, with the U.S. engineers performing a survey for the West Feliciana Railroad and granting other public land and rights of way. Merle Reed documents that in 1833, the Louisiana legislature created a board of public works who owned their own gangs, plural, gangs of Negro laborers owned by the state. As Reed writes in the footnotes, in 1833, the purchase of 150 Negro laborers was authorized for use in public works projects. When these laborers were not employed by the state, they were hired to internal improvement companies. Keep in mind, this thesis was written in 1957, but even then, they were very careful to try to minimize the use of the word slave as much as they could, instead saying laborers. Well, a laborer implies that there was some sort of bargain between the person working and the person who hires them. It implies that the person working has a choice. When you buy someone, that's not a laborer, that's a slave. And when Reed writes that they were hired to internal improvement companies, well, the slaves weren't hired, they were lent out. And internal improvement companies means private interests, like the railroads, which the Louisiana Board of Public Works also invested in on behalf of the state. And as if all that wasn't enough, as if the state giving loans to the railroads and buying bonds to help them out, and the state also giving them tax exemptions and all the rest of it wasn't enough, there were some railroads in Louisiana, such as the New Orleans and Carrollton Company, who were authorized by the state to conduct banking activities for themselves. So all the money that the state of Louisiana gave them wasn't enough. Instead, on top of that, let these guys quadruple and quintuple dip and let these guys just become banks. And what, pray tell, did the railroads do with all this money they were getting? In 1835, the corporate directors of the New Orleans and Nashville Railroad purchased a number of slaves in anticipation of labor shortages the following year. Merle Reed writes that the Pontchartrain Railroad Company frequently hired slave labor and began buying slaves in 1833. They started off with 11, and two years later they increased that to 22. This is how the railroads began, and keep in mind, Louisiana wasn't the only one. They actually used what they saw in other states as a model for what they did. What was going on in Louisiana was going on all over the South. You look at other railroads, such as the Western and Pacific Railroad in Georgia, these guys were the ones who basically had a large part to do with the establishment of the city of Atlanta. Reason for that was the place that we call Atlanta today was actually the end of the Western and Atlantic Railroad. By the way, on a side note, the Western and Atlantic Railroad was owned by the state of Georgia. This is so-called capitalism in the United States. This is the so-called invisible hand of the free market. Does this look very invisible to you? These railroads were not being set up for the use of the general public. They were being set up so private businessmen could create an industry for themselves and pocket the money for themselves. And the state used the taxpayers' coffers to hand these guys money and anything else they wanted. Who needs stockholders when you're being funded by the state? William Thomas writes that the South pursued railroad expansion as fast as the North, laying as many miles of track in the 1850s as the Midwest, and even exceeding the pace of construction in much of the North. William Thomas also writes that by the 1850s, the railroad companies could be counted among the largest slaveholders in their regions. He cites the South Carolina Railroad's 1857 annual report, which documented that the company owned 57 black people as slaves, and that in 1859, it almost doubled that number to 90. Meanwhile, the Virginia Central Railroad owned 35 black men. And how much benefit did the railroads get from all the slaves they owned? In his book, Rethinking the Civil War Era, Paul S. Scott writes that, By 1860, the South's railroad network was one of the most extensive in the world. 
and nearly all of it had been constructed by less expensive slave labor. I want you to think about that. Because whenever people try to envision the great railroad systems, the Deep South doesn't come to mind, but that's mainly because part of how white supremacy works is you drop things down the memory hole. William Thomas added that the railroad's demand for black slave labor was so high that they caused the price of slaves to go up throughout the entire region. Now imagine that. The railroads caused a slave shortage because that's how many black people that they were forcing to work for them. But then there was the question of how much revenue did the state get for their railroads. Raw cotton made up more than half the nation's exports in the first six decades of the 19th century. That's between 1800 and 1860. And all of it was grown by slaves. Industry in the North expanded rapidly, especially after the 1830s. Yeah, after those southern states got serious about putting their revenue behind these railroads. The industrial North expanded rapidly after the 1830s indeed, and now you know the reason why. So it was black labor that laid the rail lines and who laid the vast majority of them. That's important because when someone tries to tell you that the Irish or the Chinese built the railroads, that's simply not true. The Irish didn't come in any appreciable numbers until the mid-19th century, and even then they weren't a majority of railroad workers. As for the Chinese, their laborers were limited mostly to the Transcontinental Railroad, and they didn't show up to work on that until the 1860s. That's nearly two generations after black people had already built the crisscrossing network of rail lines across the South and in the East. The Transcontinental Railroad began in Sacramento, way out West. Even the History Channel's own website had to cop to that one. The Chinese laborers were almost entirely in the West. Black labor, on the other hand, was what built the rest of the country's rail lines. There's this effort on to rewrite the history books and to erase black people from it and to claim that everyone was equally involved in the building of the country and everyone was more or less here at the same time and everyone more or less made the same contribution. And that's simply not true. If some guy from an Irish shanty comes to the U.S. and gets denied a job because a business owner doesn't like Catholics, that is not the same as a black person who was born into slavery, defined as less than human by the law, and whose children are condemned to the same fate before they're even born. If some Chinese laborer immigrates here to build one rail line during a five-year period, that does not equate the black laborers who built the rail lines from the early 1800s almost up to the 1960s. As I covered in part one of this series, just looking at Wall Street, it was black people who literally built Wall Street. They built the wall and the roads around it that Wall Street was named after. Had it not been for black people who built the roads, who built the streets, who built the nation's capital, who were the ones who actually built the railroads, there would have been no country for the Irish or the Chinese or anybody else to immigrate to. And they all wanted to get in here because of the opportunities that existed, but who made those opportunities possible? Black people's relentless, uncompensated labor was what made all of that wealth possible. It couldn't have been the Irish or the Chinese or the Germans or any of the rest of them because they weren't here, certainly not in any appreciable numbers. As with the rest of the culture, the black influence on the railroads extends to a lot more than just our physical presence. You've probably heard the term Gandhi Dancer, but you probably don't know what it means. Gandhi Dancers was what black men who worked on the railroads were called, specifically the black men who performed maintenance on the rail lines. Trains are enormously heavy, and their weight is shifting all the time. This causes the railroad lines to become deformed over time. So what happened was the railroads needed black men to go out there and literally pull the rail lines back into shape. The term Gandhi most likely comes from the Gandhi Manufacturing Company of Chicago. That was the company who supplied hand tools for the railroad workers. And as for the dancer part, that was because the black railroad workers had to move in unison in order to push those steel rail lines back into shape. Often time, they would work to a song. One member of the road crew would act as the lead, usually singing some song that would establish the rhythm of the work. And they weren't doing it just for entertainment purposes either. In order to maximize the amount of force the black men could exert on the steel, they had to push or pull with pinpoint precision. 
The lead man singing established the exact rhythm that would allow them to do this back-breaking work for hours a day. So not only did black men build America's railroads, they also maintained them too. And it stands testament to how strong these men were that even when they were elderly, they were still able to demonstrate how they pulled the rail lines back into shape. At a point when most men their age are either in a rocking chair or a wheelchair, these men are demonstrating work that they did decades ago, showing that even the rail lines weren't strong enough to break a black man's back. Pretty much the only jobs that black men were prohibited at that time to have any part in was being a conductor on the train, but other than that, black men did practically everything else. Black people were also forced to build a number of the piers, docks, and ports of the United States, and it should be noted that a number of those rail lines and ports and docks are still in use to this very day. And just as with the banks, a number of those railroads wound up either being gobbled up or merged with some other rail lines or some other business, a few of whom are still around in some form or another to the very present. There were a lot of entities at all levels who were making a killing every single day off of the enslavement of our people and the free labor that we were forced to produce. So while they were riding the railroad, we were the ones being railroaded. That's the reason why we are not dropping the issue of the reparations that we are owed. It's time that all of these profiteers from slavery were put on notice that their gravy train just derailed. Way back when I used to do videos regarding ancient Kemet, I pointed out that the fictional field of Egyptology was started on America's colleges and universities, and it was part of the ideology of white supremacy to invent ways to validate itself. Now, this love affair by America's Ivy League with anti-black racism didn't just start in the late 19th century. The richest and most prestigious schools in the world, right here in the United States, were founded on anti-black racism and funded by chattel slavery. Now, obviously, we're not going to be doing an exhaustive rundown of that. I'd be here for the next couple of weeks. Instead, we're going to pick a couple of examples, the two most prestigious and richest schools in the world, Harvard and Yale. We'll start with Harvard. At least two of the presidents of Harvard University were slave owners. And one of them, Benjamin Wadsworth, had his slaves living on the campus of Harvard. Harvard only recently put up a plaque acknowledging this fact, but only after the students put pressure on them to do so. John Hancock, one of the founders of the United States, was a Harvard graduate. He owned between two and 3,000 slaves. Of course, the apologists for white supremacy always try to say, well, he inherited them from his uncle. So what? That's how Thomas Jefferson got his slaves. Same for George Washington. Barack Obama bragged that he went to Harvard Law School and became the first black editor of the Harvard Law Review. Well, that explains in part why Obama never used the law to help black people. Harvard's law school was built in 1817 from funds given to them by Isaac Royal Jr. Isaac Royal Jr. came from a family of slave owners. Isaac Royal's family were in the slave trade before he was even born. Not only were they selling black people, but they also had their little plantations. So as part of his will, he made sure that Harvard University had some land and some funds that they could use to build themselves a law school. Yeah, that way they could train the next generation of white supremacists. Now, I'm sure you've seen this photograph. We all have. Whenever a TV program or documentary dealing with slavery comes on, this man's photo is usually presented. If there's some book that deals with antebellum slavery in the United States, the odds are good that this man's photograph is going to show up. His name was Renty. He was enslaved on the plantation of Colonel Thomas Taylor in Columbia, South Carolina. Our ancestors were forced to do all manner of degrading things, and this was one of them. There are, as many of you know, other photos of Renty and other enslaved black people, including Renty's own daughter, but I'm not going to be showing them. What you need to know about is the story behind it. Do you know how this photograph and the others came to be? Because in 1850, Harvard University commissioned this photo and the others. 
They did it on behalf of one of their professors, Louis Agassiz. This man was a zoologist, and under white supremacy, there's no white man who's so unqualified that he can't be allowed to give his opinion about black people. He was a proponent of polygenesis, the idea that black and white people have separate origins and hence are separate species altogether. As a faculty member in the Ivy League, Agassiz understood it was Harvard's mission to prove the superiority of the white race and the inferiority of black people. So he asked that a set of pictures be taken of black people undressed. This was done on behalf of Harvard University, who, by the way, still possesses those photos. And it wasn't done for a history course, but for a biology course, specifically to push the idea that black people are inherently inferior. For reasons. The Ivy League schools are where the doctrines of black physical and mental inferiority began, and they're also the main ones pushing it to this very day. It's where the white supremacists work to give their crackpot theories an air of legitimacy by using or even inventing academic-sounding language. It's one of white supremacy's favorite ploys. Use $10 words to try to dupe people into thinking that their blatant anti-black racism somehow is intellectual. This is what Harvard University is about. One of Renty's descendants went to court to force Harvard to give the photos of her ancestors to their family, but the courts declared that they belong to Harvard. Harvard makes money off these photos, by the way. They use them on the covers of their brochures. After the lawsuit, Harvard declared that they were going to be making the photos more accessible to the public. No doubt for the price of a ticket. So in other words, it's business as usual for Harvard. And that's not all. Almost exactly one year ago, Harvard's own Peabody Museum of Archaeology and Ethnology discovered that they have the remains of enslaved black people among their collections. Sure, they just now figured that out. And I'm sure that all of the uprisings and black people holding racist institutions to account didn't have anything to do with Harvard suddenly discovering, man, we got the remains of these enslaved black folks in our possession. They didn't figure it out until now. They didn't even know about it until now. Yeah, right. And Yale, of course, was no better. Yale University is named after Elihu Yale. Now, he wasn't the founder of it, but it was named after him because of his generous donations to it. White media makes it a point to hide behind the lie that there's no evidence that Elihu Yale ever owned slaves, as if that makes his being in the slave trade less reprehensible. As governor of Fort St. George, he oversaw and authorized the sale of hundreds of people. And for a man who apparently had all manner of reservations about slavery, he sure didn't have a problem having portraits of himself painted alongside enslaved black people and making sure they were featured prominently. Because that's how the white supremacists of old showed the world that they had arrived. That they owned people. For a man who allegedly didn't own any slaves, he sure did seem proud of being seen with them. So to say that Elihu Yale never owned slaves would be like saying Osama bin Laden never made a bomb or never hijacked an airplane. Elihu Yale was born in 1649, long before the U.S. was founded. He came from a prosperous family. His father was a merchant in Boston, but apparently he must not have liked the weather because Yale's father took the family back to their native Britain. Elihu Yale never set foot in the Americas again, though after a lifetime of enslaving, pillaging, and plundering, he decided to become a benefactor of sorts to a school in New Haven, Connecticut called the Collegiate School of Saybrook. He sent a donation of books to the school in 1718. Noted Harvard graduate and slave owner Cotton Mather wrote to Yale, telling him that if he sent another gift, only larger this time, they could be influenced to name a school after him. Yale could take a hint, so he sent more books, a picture of the British dictator King George and textiles from the East Indies. The people in Connecticut sold the donations for cash, getting them 800 pounds, which they used to construct a building which they named after Yale. So, if you ever wondered where the American tradition of schools naming their buildings after rich donors comes from, now you know. Yale finally kicked the bucket in 1721, and in 1745, the people at Shady Brook, er, I mean Saybrook, changed the name of their little community college to Yale University. Of course, Yale University's connections with slavery didn't end with Elihu Yale. 
Yale's own website had to admit that the university's Connecticut Hall was built by slaves. But it didn't end there. In the early 18th century, the Colonial Assembly of Connecticut gave the tax revenue they generated from slave-produced sugar cane to Yale University. Yale used the money to fund the school and to construct a number of their early buildings. So Yale University was literally built with money from the slave trade, and it was the state who gave it to them. There were also a lot of slave owners connected to the school, including half of its founding trustees. One of Yale's most famous school presidents, Timothy Dwight IV, was a slave owner. He was also a mentor to a large number of other pro-slavery fanatics, including John C. Calhoun. John Calhoun became a senator and then vice president of the United States. He also owned about 80 black people as slaves. Now, you don't hear much of anything about old John Calhoun, and that's because the white media can't portray him as being conflicted over slavery. You know, the usual line of BS that they bring up whenever talking about some slave owner. You can't do the usual, well, he, his relationship with slavery was complicated. He was a complicated man. No, John Calhoun was as straightforward and simple about slavery as it comes. He delivered a pro-slavery speech to the U.S. Senate on February 6, 1837, in which he declared, Abolition and the Union cannot coexist. As the friend of the Union, I openly proclaim it, and the sooner it is known, the better. We of the South will not, cannot surrender our institutions. To maintain the existing relations between the two races inhabiting that sector of the Union is indispensable to the peace and happiness of both. It cannot be subverted without drenching the country in blood and extirpating one or the other of the races. Be it good or bad, slavery has grown up with our society and institutions and is so interwoven with them that to destroy it would be to destroy us as a people. But let me not be understood as admitting, even by implication, that the existing relations between the two races in the slaveholding states is an evil, far otherwise. I hold it to be a good, as it has thus far proved itself to be to both, and will continue to prove so if not disturbed by the fell spirit of abolition. Never before has the black race of Central Africa, from the dawn of history to the present day, attained a condition so civilized and so improved, not only physically but morally and intellectually, I may say with truth that in few countries so much is left to the share of the laborer and so little exacted from him. It would be a miracle if he was saying that with a straight face, craggy and crooked as his is. Anyway, he continued saying, compare his condition, talking about our ancestors, with the tenants of the poor houses in the more civilized portions of Europe. Look at the sick and the old and infirm slave on one hand, in the midst of his family and friends, under the kind superintending care of his master and mistress, and compare it with the forlorn and wretched condition of the pauper in the poor house. I turn to the political, and here I fearlessly assert that the existing relation between the two races in the South forms the most solid and durable foundation on which to rear free and stable political institutions. It is useless to disguise the fact. There is, and always has been, an advanced stage of wealth and civilization, a conflict between labor and capital. The condition of society in the South exempts us from the disorders and dangers resulting from this conflict. This is what one of Yale University's most celebrated and revered graduates said to the U.S. Senate. He said the slave plantation solved the conflict between labor and capital. That's what he was saying. People have arguments about conflicts between labor and capital today. John Calhoun said we found the answer. But it's what he said before that that I think is even more important. He says that the enslavement of black people is the most solid and durable foundation for a free and stable political institution. That's important for you folks out here who keep talking all this idiocy about democracy and preserving institutions and such. John Calhoun explained what America's political structures are built on. They're built on your black back. Black subjugation is the foundation upon which the United States rests. It's not a bug, it's a feature. It's not the messy excesses of freedom. This is what it's all about. This is the game. Keep black people oppressed. Because the sick, degenerate mentality of John Calhoun wasn't limited just to him. 
This is the indoctrination that the Ivy League schools give to their graduates to the present day. They just don't say it as bluntly as Calhoun did. And then you wonder why Barack Obama twiddles his thumbs and actually, I, 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 not, not really a whole lot I can do. Nothing, nothing, nothing I can do. Why is it that the Democrats make it a point they're not going to do anything that black people says? Why, that would bring down the republic. This is why black people cannot afford to let white liberals tell us that our problem is a class problem. The people with money in this country, they don't look at white people the same way they look at black folks. Calhoun didn't propose that his solution should be enforced against white people, just black people. So what does that tell you? His solution wasn't a class issue, it was a racial one. And that keeping black people oppressed was the best way to perpetuate and reinforce their political institutions. He made it very clear that this is about more than just money. It's about more than just a white racist feeling superior. Oppressing black people is the foundation upon which Western civilization rests. Black oppression is what makes this country's political institutions stable. If black people are able to change their condition, then that threatens not just the slave owners, but the entire system. Now, I want you to think about all of the Yale and Harvard graduates that you got in the U.S. government and in corporate America. Everything from entertainment to all of these little schools and such. These guys claim to have all kinds of differing ideas when it comes to society, politics, the arts and such. But when it comes to black people, they're all in lockstep about that. Because anti-black racism was not merely part of their education, it was the totality of it. Yale and their graduates have been taught for hundreds of years that the best way to have free and stable political institutions is anti-black racism. The way to eliminate the conflict between labor and capital is not to pay more or to have better working conditions, but to dehumanize black people who do the work and define them as being less than human. Now, I can hear the white supremacist troll or the bootlick saying now, well, you can't directly connect John Calhoun's anti-black racism to Yale. That was just him ranting in front of the Congress. You can't actually say that Yale approved of that. Actually, I can. In 1933, Yale built the Calhoun College, and they decorated it with stained glass windows, one of which depicted Calhoun standing with an enslaved black man kneeling before him in shackles. Another of the stained glass images showed black people toiling in the cotton fields. This is no exaggeration. This is what Yale University put on the windows of their Calhoun College. This was not a choice by some architect. This is what Yale wanted there. Yale had those images up for decades until a few years ago when a black Yale alumni made them remove the panels showing the black man shackled and kneeling in front of Calhoun. Now, they left up the part about Calhoun. They left that up. They just said, okay, we'll go ahead and um, remove the black man from there, but we'll keep the rest of it. Later on, a black man who worked there broke the window showing the plantation scene. Yale tried to clean it up and white splain after the fact and say, well, they had planned to remove that image all along themselves. Yeah, sure they did. Now understand something. John Calhoun didn't build that college. He was already dead and roasting in hell long before that college was built. It was the white supremacists who run Yale who were the ones who decided to build a monument to him. They knew exactly what he was about because it's exactly what they're about. And if black people hadn't put pressure on Yale, they'd still have up pictures of shackled black men kneeling in front of slave owners. Those images were an expression of philosophy on Yale's part, not just the racists who built that thing back in the 30s, but for the school who allows it to be there to the present day. But Yale's involvement with anti-black racism goes way beyond just some racist politicians and artwork. Yale is not just connected to the eugenics movement, Yale University was one of the main backers of it. Yale's own website admits that the American Eugenic Society was started at Yale. It was a Yale faculty member who thought it up, and at least three Yale faculty members were on its board. Though the Yale website conveniently leaves out who these members are, and they don't say where you can find the information either. Yale pats itself on the back for confronting its historical involvement with slavery, but they only give fragments of information. A partial confession isn't a confession at all. It just goes to show never send a white supremacist pseudo-academic to do a professor's job.
The American Eugenic Society was founded at Yale University in 1926. Irving Fisher, a Yale faculty member who taught economics at the school, was the one who thought it up. He was a die-hard white supremacist obsessed with racial purity, particularly being pure from black people. Prior to the American Eugenic Society, Fisher had helped to found the Race Betterment Foundation in 1914. By the way, the man who co-founded the Race Betterment Foundation with Fisher and provided him with the money is a name that you'll probably readily recognize. John Henry Kellogg. Yes, that Kellogg's. In fact, John Kellogg is credited with having invented the baking process for turning the flat sheets of dough into flakes. In other words, he's credited with being the inventor of breakfast cereal. So maybe Tony the Tiger's motto should be, they're racist. On a side note, John Kellogg was also an alleged doctor who ran a sanitarium, believe it or not, where he pioneered all manner of groundbreaking therapies, including electric current administered to the eyeballs and the 15-quart enema. I'm not making that last part up. That was one of his ideas, to run 15 quarts of water through someone's colon to cleanse it. I don't know if this Kellogg guy ran the sanitarium or if he escaped from it, but I want you to understand these are the guys who were the main proponents of eugenics in the United States, the main ones running around talking about bettering the race, mostly by getting rid of inferior people. This is the kind of stuff that these guys were up to. Anyway, back to Kellogg's unindicted co-conspirator, Irving Fisher. Fisher was heavily involved in the eugenics movement and attended the Eugenicist International Meetings. He was the one who proposed the creation of the American Eugenic Society, and he knew just the place that it should be headquartered, at his place of employment, Yale University. So understand, it was a Yale-educated economist who was the most gung-ho to spread the idea of black people being inherently inferior. Now, when you understand that Fisher was an economist, John Calhoun's statements about labor and capital take on a deeper meaning, don't they? Another Yale faculty member, Dean Winternitz, who was the dean of Yale's medical school, was also a founding member of the American Eugenic Society. Ellsworth Huntington was a geography professor at Yale from 1907 until 1917. About 15 years later, he became president of the board of the American Eugenicist Society. This is what Yale University did. The doctrines of anti-black racism, it was not just a matter of one or two fuzzy-headed academics who were there. It wasn't just one or two professors. These guys wanted to make it where their schools were going to be the central hub. It was going to be the core of the eugenics movement. It wasn't born out of some political movement. It wasn't born in some church or some political party. It came out of the universities. These guys knew that there would be absolutely no opposition to them setting up a eugenic society on school campus precisely because that was the mission of the Ivy League schools. And not only were they obsessed with making sure that they spread and promoted the ideals of anti-black racism, but they also were hell-bound and determined that black people were never going to be able to set up institutions of their own. In the early 19th century, a collection of free black leaders attempted to establish a college for colored youth in New Haven, and they were fought by both the city and by Yale University. As Yale's own website admits, the proposed college met overwhelming resistance from the Yale and New Haven communities, including prominent Yale faculty and alumni. Opponents argued that a new black college would harm the city's existing institutions, including Yale and a school for women. As one resolution against the building of the school put it, the establishment of a college in the same place to educate the colored population is incompatible with prosperity. Of course, these few examples that I give you from Harvard and Yale barely even skim the surface of the Ivy League's mountain of crimes. But again, I'll be here till next week if I try to do something that's even halfway exhaustive. The relevant question, in fact, the entire reason that I wanted to single out the Ivy League schools for the Who Owes Us Reparations series, is how much money did these slave-owning institutions reap from their anti-black racism? Well, it made Harvard University the wealthiest school on the planet. Harvard University's endowment is now valued at $53.2 billion. That's billion with a B.
Harvard University takes the money they get from tuitions and donors and such, and they invest it in the stock market. They're not a school, clearly. They're an investment house masquerading as a school. And Yale's endowment comes in second place with a mere $42.3 billion. So understand that anti-black racism, chattel slavery didn't just make the Ivy League schools financially stable. It didn't just make them rich. It enabled them to become unbelievably wealthy. And what have these schools done with all that ill-gotten money? They use it to justify the dehumanization and segregation and oppression of black people. Their alumni went into high office and they used the prestige of the university to write laws and to push policies meant to dehumanize and to marginalize black people out of existence. And it's not just the Ivy League, of course. University of Virginia is racist as hell. How could it not be? It was founded by Thomas Jefferson. The school had black slaves who were forced to labor there. How can a school claim to be a place that values knowledge above all else when the guy who founded it wouldn't even own up to the children he had by the woman that he raped for 30 years? Because white supremacy has no principles other than power. And just to show you how all of this stuff is interconnected, last week we were talking about the railroads, you recall. You might have heard of the name Cornelius Vanderbilt. He was a railroad and shipping magnate. He was also a slave owner. And he used his money to found Vanderbilt University. The first chancellor of Vanderbilt, Landon Garland, was a slave owner and lectured around the country that black people were inherently inferior and slavery was the biggest favor ever done for black people and had made black people, quote, serviceable to himself and to the world and elevated and improved socially, morally, intellectually, and physically. Gee, you have to wonder, did John Calhoun write that for him? Whenever one of these white supremacist scumbags claims that slavery did all these favors for black people and did them all that good, your first response should be, if slavery was so beneficial, why didn't white people make it exclusively for themselves? And just like Harvard and Yale, Vanderbilt also has a building named after those various slave owners and Confederate figures. But this is just one or two examples of who the United States educational system was founded by. The individuals who the most prestigious schools in the nation were started by and staffed by and what ideas it is that they promote. This is why America's Ivy League universities are so eager to hire people like Amy Chua and to put them on every board and committee that the schools got. This is why the think tanks have such an easy time finding some Princeton or Columbia graduate who will manufacture their anti-black racist talking points. It's because anti-black racism is part of the Ivy League's DNA. They were built on slavery. The tens of billions that these institutions now own are the direct result of slavery in this country. Well, we're going to teach these Ivy League racists an economics lesson that Irving Fisher wouldn't have approved of. When you engage in anti-black racism, you will pay. I had originally said that my little series on reparations was going to be three parts. I decided that I would put an epilogue on it. A large number of people in the comments have been noting that the government owes reparations above all others. And you're absolutely right. And although the government's responsibility for and involvement in the slave trade goes without saying, nonetheless, it must be said. And when I say government, I'm not just talking about the U.S. government. I already told you about how you had states like the state of Louisiana that owned black people under their Department of Public Works in the early 19th century. So when we say government, we're talking about city, county, state, and federal. Because the states and a large number of cities also had their own laws and statutes and codes and ordinances that made it where they not merely enforced slavery but also profited from it. I mention that because I think there's a lot of people who downplay the importance, the significance, or even the necessity of making sure that individual states also have to be put on the hook for reparations to fight for them at the state level. But keep in mind, it was the states who were enforcing slavery and benefited from it directly, so they're as responsible as the federal government. However, we do focus on the federal government because Congress has the power of the purse. The states can try to play the game of economic keep away by screaming, we just don't have the money, we don't have the ability to print our own money, so we just don't have it. The federal government, however, cannot. 
Now, we know that the U.S. federal government paid to make sure that black people were forced to build the White House and the Capitol building, among other landmarks in D.C. The overwhelming majority of America's first presidents owned slaves. We're talking about heads of government, and they owned slaves while they were in office. While they were in the White House, they did this. And that number becomes even greater if you count the presidents who had owned slaves at some point in their lives, including Ulysses S. Grant. As I've always told you, anti-black racism has always had bipartisan support. But the U.S. government's crimes against us did not end in 1865. When they passed the 13th Amendment, they left in a slavery loophole. All you have to do is look at the wording of the 13th Amendment. Neither slavery nor involuntary servitude except as a punishment for crime. That word except nullifies everything that came before it in the sentence. This is as blatant an admission as you could possibly get that the U.S. government's declared. John Q. Citizen can no longer own slaves, but Uncle Sam can. And Uncle Sam has. And they've also extended that to the powers of the state. The state and local governments could do the same thing. Slavery went from being a private sector institution to a public sector one. This is a distinction without a difference. It becomes even more so when you look at the fact that it says, unless you've been duly convicted, yeah, but who are the ones who actually prosecute the cases? Who are the judges who hear the cases? Who comprises the jury? Unless you guarantee that black people are not being singled out for prosecution, that the judges are not discriminating, and that the juries actually represent a jury of the accused peers and not just a bunch of white people who already just want to put away every black person they can, unless you've done that, then no, there's no such thing as duly convicted. You're just getting railroaded, which of course is the entire point. So slavery never stopped. That's the first thing that we have to get straight here. The peculiar institution has always been around. Maybe it's been a little more peculiar than people expect because they watch a lot of movies and TV. But the effect is exactly the same, which is exactly what was intended. From the chain gangs to the prison industrial complex, slavery never ended. Not because I say so, but because the U.S. government says so. The same government who proposed financial recompense to our ancestors and then immediately broke their word. Now, of course, the white supremacists will try to claim that the 40 acres and a mule was never an act passed by Congress, so it's not binding, etc., etc. Well, in a moment, I'll show you some examples of laws passed by Congress that included black people and which the government still categorically ignored anyway. But even without the 40 acres and a mule, after the Civil War, black people began building. Soon, there were black universities, townships, and banks. In many areas, black citizens were financially better off than their white neighbors. Because the federal government had troops in the cities to control the white supremacist mobs, and also the government stood behind the laws meant to prohibit the racists from impeding black political and economic progress. In other words, there was government force behind the laws passed after the Civil War. But that's not to say that the white government liked it. Within the first five years after the Civil War, black people had seats in the House of Representatives and even a senator. And that was at the federal level. At the state level, we had far more representation. But what exactly does that mean? What kind of authority did black people have in the post-Civil War period? As I've always said, black empowerment will not come into its own until we have the ability to punish the white supremacists and to exercise control over them. Well, here's an image for you, an engraving from 1878. This engraving is of an African-American constable in Virginia who's flogging a white woman for stealing a pair of shoes. This engraving dates from 1878. I want you to think about that. That's just 13 years after the American Civil War was over. A mere seven years after the government passed the KKK Act of 1871, and you'll notice that what you have in this image is also a bunch of white men who are standing there watching this. I think it's safe to say that they certainly didn't approve, but by the same token, the law applies equally to everyone at this point. And there are also the federal troops to consider. So if you decide to yourself that maybe you don't like the fact that the law is being applied equally, well, the government's making sure that you're not able to change that. That's what you call justice. Justice. 
And although certainly this was not the case throughout all of the cities and townships and counties and states, the point is the fact that this was even happening for a whole lot of those white supremacists, they were looking and going, hold on, this this racial equality thing's going far too far. These Negroes, they literally are the ones holding the whip. And they weren't the only ones who wanted to make sure that this growing black empowerment was stopped immediately, dead in its tracks. While it's true that Southern Democrats hated seeing black people able to compete, it's also true that the Northern Yankee didn't like it either. So starting in 1877, the white Northerners and white Southerners agreed that black progress had to be stopped and that they would work together to make sure that it was stopped. The so-called Compromise of 1877 wasn't forced on the U.S. government. It was agreed to by both the white North and white South to make nice again with each other and reunite under the unifying principle of white supremacy. Anti-black racism. The government withdrew federal troops from the South. But more than that, they also refused to enforce the laws that had been passed. That was deliberate. Because although there would certainly be the most brutal expressions of anti-black violence in the South, the North also had its own sundown towns, racial segregation. It was as bad in places as Chicago and Detroit as it was in New Orleans or in Memphis. Moreover than that, now that the government made it very clear this is going to be national policy, it was understood by black people you didn't have anybody to appeal to. The government made it very clear that they were taking sides, and the side that they were on was team white supremacy. Laws such as the KKK Act of 1871, which some of you have probably heard of being used in regards to the January 6th insurrectionists, those laws are on the books still used today, and yet they've never been applied for the benefit of black people. The government was a complicit partner in the racial genocides that took place following Reconstruction and proceeded into the early decades of the 20th century. When white supremacist gangs began marauding across the country, destroying black townships, the U.S. government did nothing about it until the Tulsa massacre, but the government's action in that case was to take sides with the white marauders. U.S. government made sure to back up those white supremacist genocides every time they happened. Either they were actively helping to carry them out or at the very least saying, well, we're not going to do anything about it. That's complicity. That's the government taking part. And the government's anti-black racist policies didn't stop in the 19th century. World War II was seen as an excellent opportunity to take the racial hierarchy and freeze it in place for at least another hundred years. Take, for instance, the GI Bill. The GI Bill was principally about three things. Money for education, money for housing, and money to start a business for the G.I.s returning from World War II. Black G.I.s, however, were categorically denied all of these things. And it wasn't just a few of them, it was practically all of them. Now, the white media tries to play this game of, well, uh, some black veterans were denied G.I. Bill benefits. That's a lie. Practically all of them were denied benefits. It wasn't just one or two of them. As far as housing went, the GI Bill got the returning white veterans low interest loans with no money down. And keep in mind, this was back in the 1940s and 50s when houses didn't cost anywhere near what they do today and didn't require as much of your income as they do today. But more than that, the GI Bill's housing provision was specifically written to incentivize the building of new construction. As a bank, if you really wanted for Uncle Sam to cake you off, just make sure that that GI is asking for money to build a new home. This was the federal government putting its hand on the scales to make sure that there were going to be a baby boom and a boom in new housing. The first two years after the war, 40% of mortgages issued were guaranteed by the Veterans Administration. That's in the first two years after the war. Two out of every five homes that had mortgages were being backed up by the Veterans Administration. By 1955, the VA was backing close to a third of housing starts. So 10 years after World War II was over, 30% of new housing was being backed by the federal government's Veterans Administration. But the question is, how many of those went to black people? The answer, practically none. You had redlining being carried out by the U.S. government. They were the ones who oversaw it. But for the white GIs, new subdivisions sprang up overnight. Suddenly, you had new towns on the outskirts of the major cities, places called suburbs. 
This wasn't because millions of people suddenly became rich. The housing boom wasn't because of all these people who suddenly got educated. The government paid for it. The government bought it for them. And as for black GIs, practically none of them were able to get any of these housing loans, any of these educational loans. They weren't able to get any of these business loans. And just in case a black GI did, the one or two of them who did manage to get one, no doubt much lower than what a white GI got, Or if a black family wanted to move into those suburbs, well, those areas had racial covenants in place that mandated that only white people could live in those areas. And even the places that didn't have openly racial covenants didn't need them because the banks were all on code and systematically denied black GIs housing loans. So for the brain-dead morons who tried the lie that, oh, the free market would certainly address this issue, I mean, the banks would do what's in their self-interest, it's in their interest to write loans. No, there are people who, when it comes to white supremacy, that's more important to them than financial gain. I think it was Elliot Spitzer who said something to the effect of, the need to be able to discriminate against black people is more important to these people than profit motive. So no, I'm afraid it's not about green, it is all about black and white. So the same way that we saw targeted policies aimed at black people in the 19th century to deprive us of what little wealth we were trying to accumulate in the 20th century, they turbocharged it. Understand that the creation of the suburbs and their racial makeup were not accidents, they were planned. They were the result of massive amounts of funding by the federal government, who made sure that black people, whose tax money went to build those white enclaves, would be excluded. The black veterans whose sacrifice won the war were denied the very benefits that their sacrifice made possible. Of course, the same thing went for businesses as well. The Department of Veterans Affairs categorically refused to give loans to black GIs. So if you were a white GI coming back from World War II, you had your education, your home, and your first business all paid for by the federal government. The white middle class was not some natural phenomenon. And no matter what it is that white people in America may say, it was not the result of hard work, dent, and industry. It was handed to them because they were classified as white. This was the result of policy, racial policy, as were the black ghettos. The suburbs and the slums were both an invention of the U.S. government's policies. The suburbs and the yuppies were created out of whole cloth by a federal government who selectively put funds into white people's hands and selectively kept it out of black people's hands. And you had a white media going right along with it, ignoring it if they could, but if that wasn't possible, doing everything they could to justify it. The wealth that we had generated for hundreds of years was confiscated from us and redistributed to everyone except for us. And it happened again in the 20th century. They confiscate our tax dollars and redistribute the wealth that we generate to everyone except for ourselves and make laws prohibiting us to be able to have the benefits of our own earnings. No business loans, no low interest housing loans, no access to institutions of higher learning. The only policy they had for us was redlining. The banks were merely the administrators of it. The banks were carrying out a government policy, no different than the railroads in the 19th century who the government gave loans to and helped them get funding by taking out bonds on behalf of those banks. The government were the ones who wanted the railroads. The white bankers and businessmen who owned the rail lines were merely carrying out the government's policy. Now, starting around the late 1960s, basically at the end of the civil rights movement, where there was this idea that all of these rowdy black folks need to be displaced all over again. So we started seeing gentrification, which was being carried out with huge amounts of government money as well. White supremacists whine all the time about the so-called great replacement. I don't know about you, but I haven't seen any white people disappearing. That racist who lives up the block from you or works on your job, he hasn't been replaced. He's still the same jerk he always is. He hasn't gone anywhere. That talking point is not the result of any anxiety about what might happen. They're looking at their own behavior and projecting it onto us. There was already a great replacement, and it happened to black people in cities like Detroit, Chicago, Los Angeles, and New York. As a case study, take the former township of Lenintown, Georgia. You had a black community which, by the 1960s, 60% of the residents owned their own land. But the land was seized by the city of Athens, Georgia, and handed over to the University of Georgia. They basically paid practically nothing for it. The residents didn't get really much of anything for it. 
Now, the white media will try to claim, well, the city did give them some kind of payment, but what the white media conveniently leaves out is that the money wasn't enough for them to buy a home. They paid them well below fair market value, especially for a site that's about to become a lot more valuable. And considering that this was at a time when houses didn't cost what they do today, you know this was an act of highway robbery. The black families of Linentown largely wound up either in public housing or having to move out of the city altogether. The single most important material possession necessary for generational wealth is land ownership. That's the single most important one. To take someone's land and then give them a pittance for it, that is to deliberately impoverish them. But the white supremacists in Athens, Georgia and the University of Georgia couldn't have done it alone. Under the federal government's urban renewal program, cities and colleges were empowered to take property in what was called slum clearance. The University of Georgia and the Athens city government simply took lots and then burned them to the ground. This is why way back in we're all Detroiters now, I was the one who coined the phrase gentrification is ethnic cleansing American style. Please understand that these were not the messy excesses of government policy. These were not the externalities of otherwise race-neutral policies. The forced exodus of black people from the South at the turn of the 19th century and the current forced black flight out of the major cities of the North has been going on unabated for 150 years. This was the plan all along. It wasn't an accident. And this stuff didn't happen merely because the U.S. government was off twiddling its thumbs. It happened because the U.S. government was overseeing it. The U.S. government was carrying this out. So any way you want to slice it, the biggest perpetrators of slavery and the crushing anti-black racism that's followed has been the government at all levels. And we're going to make it clear that we're not accepting any excuses. And we're not accepting any half measures either. You can keep your apologies. We didn't ask for apologies and we don't need it. That's not what we demanded. The only thing you can do for us is what you should have done 500 years ago. Cut the check. Good day and be one.